Obstacle Cause by Frederick Bastiat, taken from Sophisms of the Protectionists. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 2. Obstacle Cause the obstacle mistaken for the cause, scarcity mistaken for abundance. The sophism is the same. It is well to study it under every aspect. Man naturally is in a state of entire destitution. Between this state and the satisfying of his wants, there exists a multitude of obstacles, which it is the object of labor to surmount. It is interesting to seek how and why he could have been led to look even upon these obstacles to his happiness as the cause of it. I wish to take a journey of some hundred miles but between the point of my departure and my destination there are interposed mountains, rivers, swamps, forests, robbers, in a word, obstacles, and to conquer these obstacles it is necessary that I should bestow much labor and great efforts in opposing them or what is the same thing if others do it for me i must pay them the value of their exertions it is evident that i should have been better off had these obstacles never existed through the journey of life in the long series of days from the cradle to the tomb Man has many difficulties to oppose him in his progress. Hunger, thirst, sickness, heat, cold, are so many obstacles scattered along his road. In a state of isolation, he would be obliged to combat them all by hunting, fishing, agriculture, spinning, weaving, architecture, etc. And it is very evident that it would be better for him that these difficulties should exist to a less degree, or even not at all. In a state of society he is not obliged, personally, to struggle with each of these obstacles, but others do it for him and he in return must remove some one of them for the benefit of his fellow men. Again, it is evident that, considering mankind as a whole, it would be better for society that these obstacles should be as weak and as few as possible. But if we examine closely and in detail the phenomena of society and the private interests of men as modified by exchange of produce, we perceive without difficulty how it has happened that wants have been confounded with riches and the obstacle with the cause. The separation of occupations which results from the habits of exchange causes each man, instead of struggling against all surrounding obstacles, to combat only one, the effort being made not for himself alone, but for the benefit of his fellows, who in their turn render a similar service to him. Now it hence results that this man looks upon the obstacle which he has made it his profession to combat, for the benefit of others, 
as the immediate cause of his riches. The greater, the more serious, the more stringent may be his obstacle, the more he is remunerated for the conquering of it by those who are relieved by his labors. A physician, for instance, does not busy himself in baking his bread, or in manufacturing his clothing and his instruments. Others do it for him, and he, in return, combats the maladies with which his patients are afflicted. The more dangerous and frequent these maladies are, the more others are willing, the more even are they forced to work in his service. Disease, then, which is an obstacle to the happiness of mankind, becomes to him the source of his comforts. The reasoning of all producers is, in what concerns themselves, the same. As the doctor draws his profits from disease, so does the shipowner from the obstacles called distance, the agriculturalist from that named hunger, the cloth manufacturer from cold. The schoolmaster lives upon ignorance, the jeweler upon vanity, the lawyer upon quarrels, the notary upon breach of faith. Each profession has then an immediate interest in the continuation, even in the extension of the particular obstacle to which its attention has been directed. Theorists, hence, go on to found a system upon these individual interests, and say, Wants are riches. Labor is riches. The obstacle to well-being is well-being. To multiply obstacles is to give food to industry. Then comes the statesman and as the developing and propagating of obstacles is the developing and propagating of riches, what more natural than that he should bend his efforts to that point? He says, for instance, if we prevent a large importation of iron, we create a difficulty in procuring it. This obstacle, severely felt, obliges individuals to pay in order to relieve themselves from it. A certain number of our citizens giving themselves up to the combating of this obstacle will thereby make their fortunes. In proportion, too, as the obstacle is great and the mineral scarce, inaccessible, and of difficult and distant transportation, in the same proportion will be the number of laborers maintained by the various branches of this industry. The same reasoning will lead to the suppression of machinery. Here are men who are at a loss how to dispose of their wine harvest. This is an obstacle which other men set about removing for them by the manufacture of casks. It is fortunate, say our statesmen, that this obstacle exists, since it occupies a portion of the labor of the nation, and enriches a certain number of our citizens. But here is presented to us an ingenious machine, which cuts down the oak, squares it, makes it into staves, and gathering these together, forms them into casks. The obstacle is thus diminished, and with it the profits of the coopers. We must prevent this. Let us proscribe the machine. To sift thoroughly this sophism, 
it is sufficient to remember that human labor is not an end, but a means. It is never without employment. If one obstacle is removed, it seizes another, and mankind is delivered from two obstacles by the same effort which was at first necessary for one. If the labor of coopers becomes useless, it must take another direction. But with what, it may be asked, will they be remunerated? Precisely with what they are at present remunerated. For if a certain quantity of labor becomes free from its original occupation, to be otherwise disposed of, a corresponding quantity of wages must thus also become free. To maintain that human labor can end by wanting employment, it would be necessary to prove that mankind will cease to encounter obstacles. In such a case, labor would be not only impossible, it would be superfluous. We should have nothing to do, because we should be all-powerful, and our fiat alone would satisfy at once our wants and our desires. End of Obstacle Cause by Frederick Bastiat Recording by Robert Scott Mojo Move four one one dot com M O J O M O V E four one one dot com September the first two thousand and seven